In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? Have you ever read a passage in the Bible, you know, and, and you just had to kind of chuckle out loud? You know, you just kind of read it and you're like, oh man, right? You know, and, and part of the reason for the chuckle is maybe a little bit of kind of a lack of understanding or confusion, at least in my case, all right? And part of the reason for the chuckle is because of this. <clears throat> yeah, right. You got to be kidding me, all right? You must be joking me, God. Are you serious? Well, that's exactly what I feel when I read that passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? This Disney, Cinderella, Snow White, it's a small world after all passage, right? Now, I don't know if you've read this before. I don't even know if you've thought about this passage before because the passages coming after it are pretty poignant themselves. Often talked about, always be prepared for the hope that you have in him, right? Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. But I can almost imagine Peter saying this in his best theater voice, right? He's got his makeup on. He's got his hands clasped right in front of him. And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? Who can harm you if you're deeply committed to, who, to what is good? Everyone, right? I mean, everyone, right? Come on. Life will. Life can harm you. Friends can harm you, right? Enemies will definitely harm you. My boss will harm me. My spouse will harm me. My children will harm me if I try to do what is good. My doctor will harm me. My neighbor, my government will harm me. My community, and yes, even my church, that's who, right? I mean, it seems to never fail, right? As soon as you start or try to be deeply committed to that which is good, as soon as you even think about trying to be deeply committed to being good, it seems like harm immediately answers that sentence and finishes that sentence and that desire to do what is good, right? You're even thinking about doing something good and something bad happens. Why, right? Why do these things always seem to happen to me, right? Sometimes we think that way. I mean, I know I'm a sinner. I get it. But doesn't it seem like this is undeserved suffering? Why does it happen to me? I'm suffering for trying to do what God wants me to do. That makes no sense, right? If I was God. Why do I have to be the one who always gives in? Why do I have to be the one who always says, I'm sorry? They're just going to rub it in my face, right? Why do I have to be the one to forgive? Why do I have to be the one who always starts the conversation or always cleans up the mess? Or why do I have to be the nice one? Because whenever I do, I feel like I'm just being used. And who will harm you if you're deeply committed to doing what is good? Nah, Peter, <laughs> I ain't feeling it, right? Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? Have you ever felt that way? I mean, I've talked to some of our brothers and sisters in Christ here, and I'm not saying on Saturday and I'm not saying on Sunday, but some of our brothers and sisters, some members of this church, and it is a struggle for them. Every single day, some of them are struggling with addictions. Every single day, it's a struggle to be deeply committed to what is good, to do the right thing. And it seems like every single struggle, every single day just has harm upon harm coming. I've talked to some who have had trouble with family communication problems. Some who battle unforgiveness. Some as well who struggle with money, with lust, with cheating, with lying, with possessions taking control of their lives. Struggle with being a father or a husband the way God has called us to be. Some who struggle with helping those who just aren't exactly like us. 
So the truth be told. Even ourselves do harm to, well, ourselves when we are trying or even thinking about trying about being deeply committed to what is good. And as if this little nugget of verse isn't crazy enough, God continues through Peter by saying, and when we are deeply committed to doing what is good, we should conduct ourselves with incredible gentleness and reverence for the other person. Really? Seriously? So those people I'm trying to be nice to, who just seem to laugh at me, rub it in my face, or use me, now I'm supposed to also treat them gently and with reverence? Here, let me just lay down right here and make it easier for you to treat me like a rug, right? I mean, what's the deal? What's going on here? What is this passage really saying? Why? Why do I have to do this, right? Why? Why should I be deeply committed to what is good despite all of the suffering and what may come my way, the suffering that comes to me, the suffering that comes to my family, the suffering that comes to my possessions, or the suffering that comes to my perceptions? Why? Even that suffering that comes to my very own bank account. Why? Why does it matter? Why must I suffer? Because Peter was right. Who can harm you if you're deeply committed to what is good? Peter got it right. You see, we walk in the example of Christ. Christ who suffered for us, as Peter continued to say, so that he might offer us to God. He did not die for himself or for his own sake, but to offer us to God, to cleanse us from every sin that interferes with our relationship with God. And in this way, he presented us to God as a living sacrifice where he tabernacles, that dwells in you. Christ lives in you. No longer do you live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And as he dies, so we too should die into the flesh of all of the life struggles and stuff. And as he lives in the Spirit, so we too should live in the Spirit. And there is nothing, nothing at all that can separate us from God. How cool is that? You see, Peter was right. No harm, no evil, no suffering, nothing can affect you so that it's moving you, removing you from God's hand. If you're deeply committed to him, if you continue to live in the gospel freedom, nothing can harm you. Even if you shall lay down and close your eyes in death, you will open them to life everlasting. You know that saying, you can't kill a Christian. You just get him where he's going quicker. Nothing can harm you if you're deeply committed to what is good. And there is nothing more good than Jesus. There's a video I'd like to show you, and I do apologize two things up front. Number one, unfortunately the wording, they're gonna have a little text that goes on there. It's really hard to read <laughs> for me <laughs> as well. You might need to turn around, if you, if you so can, and see uh, the screen on the back. But the wording isn't as important as the people and the truth of this story. Now, I do give you a second warning, a caution. Some of the words that they do use are rather graphic. With that, watch this video, which is a great example of being deeply committed to God.
Sina Kachimini tended to name the Kucha Kobe and Nabana Yoko. I became a soldier when I was just a young boy. I joined because most of my relatives had been killed in the war, and I wanted to see if I could avenge at least two or three of them. All my friends joined. Some wanted to shoot a gun, some wanted to eat meat, and others thought they would get rich. So I joined with all my friends. I joined with some members of my own family and even friends from my community. But all my family members died within the first year. Even those from my village, I saw them die day by day. Life as a child soldier was not easy. It seemed like we fought every day for three years. Always there was gunfire, night and day. Many of my friends were shot, few of them lived. We had no shoes, we were cold, no shelter. My commanding officer often made us fight soldiers who were superior to us. I was always afraid. The most exciting thing for most of us who joined was shooting a gun. That was something we all wanted badly. But we soon found that we would have no shelter, they would sleep in the bush, and only officers could sleep in tents. Also, many of us didn't have shoes and we were rarely given food. We would even go without food for a week at a time. All the while we were expected to fight bravely. For me, I cannot say I learned anything positive from being a soldier because everything they told us was just brainwashing. We were told to kill, to not be concerned about our family. They turned us into animals. We just fought like animals without thinking. My commanding officer asked me to exterminate a whole family. He told me not to waste bullets, but I was to use a garden hoe. I knew this behavior was wrong, so I apologized to God for what I was asked to do. Then I slaughtered the whole family with a hoe. It is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. The reason why I left the army was because my friend was scared. We went together to talk to my commanding officer. My friend said he wanted to go home. He was tired and he missed his family. The officer shot him instantly, then kicked him as he lay on the ground dying. He told all of us that cowardice is unacceptable, that if there were any more cowards they should come forward now. Death is the punishment. I was sickened. I decided I would no longer be a part of this evil. I ran away three weeks after that day. I decided I would no longer apologize to God for my evil deeds. I decided I would serve Him instead. So I fled and started a new life. The next few years would not be easy for Levis and Isa. Christ did not magically make their lives better. Jesus never fully healed Lavis from his bullet wounds in his legs, and he still has pain when he walks. They have not been blessed financially. The war still continues in their country, but they are no longer fighting in it. Their lives have been transformed, and they are now serving their community in love. Lavis and Isa are fighting the good fight now, and they are living by faith in the one who has redeemed them. They are both leaders in their church in Gitaza town. They have begun a Bible study in their neighborhood, and they started a ministry in 2005 to prevent children from joining rebel groups. They offer the children a better way. You see, by the power of the Spirit, Lavis and Isa are choosing to live differently now that they are followers of Christ and His way.
I don't know if you caught the ages, that was seven was the youngest. These children, uh, if you ever want to learn more about them, uh, I'll definitely talk to you about them uh, later at a different time. It's not as, <laughs> not as formal. Because what I want you to learn tonight from that, from that message is that's deeply committed to what is good. Forgetting about the flesh, literally. Forgetting about no shoes, no food, being in the army, having a little bit of things provided. Forgetting about the fact that you have a death sentence on your head now. Forgetting about all that, they turn and they are transformed and now investing in other people, helping them to stay out of that same trap that they were in, being deeply committed to God, to what is good. We too have that unbelievable ability to start investing in other people. Let's start in doing that now with our neighbors, wherever we're at, no matter where we live, let us be the instruments of change in the hand of God that he uses to transform the entire world. We can do that here at St. Paul's. You can be that at St. Paul's. Let us deepen our commitment to what is good. 63% of our neighbors around our church, 63% are unchurched or de-churched. That's 6-3. 63%. And don't believe the lie either that they go to the big churches in the area or that our worship uh, is something that they wouldn't like. They don't like our style because they do like our style. They love our worship and they do need Jesus just like you and just like me. So join me, deepening our commitment to Jesus and not being afraid to suffer because no one, and that is no one, can harm you for God himself has said you are mine. And I suffered, said Jesus, so that you don't have to. Experience the good feeling of being used, but by God. Being used and trusting his word and seeing the joy and peace in you as you live in the gospel and as you deepen your commitment to him. Amen. Our service continues on page.